a lot of great content to cover today. Uh, mapping is really critical for broadband planning, increasingly so. Uh, wasn't so many years ago, five to, five years maybe, where you could people in the room could draw a map and get a pretty good idea of where they knew broadband was by their own experience or the experience of their neighbors or uh, teachers in particular, uh, IT, school IT coordinators could know where broadband was and wasn't based on how kids could do their schoolwork, especially four years ago remotely, uh, just beginning now. And so uh, a, uh, a big change though with the broadband maps and particularly the FCC maps, uh, the state of Illinois map that shows where broadband is and isn't. Uh, hopefully those two maps look a lot alike and we'll hear a lot more about that uh, later on. But first we're gonna hear from John Kostelnik and he's with Illinois State University. And he and his team have done some great research uh, initially around the benefits of broadband to agriculture. And he'll share that this morning. And then he'll describe the product that he'll bring to you later about the uh, high point areas, the vertical real estate available for wireless technologies in your counties. So that will come uh, later in the program. So uh, John, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you um, all. Um, as Bill mentioned, I'm at Illinois State University. I'm a professor of geography and I, I do mapping. I do GIS, Geographic Information Systems. And we've been very pleased, along with my colleague, Jonathan Thane, um, to work with Bill, with Benton Institute, with the Illinois Soybean Association on uh, these workshops and, and broadband in general over the last couple of, of years. Um, as Bill mentioned, a lot of mapping today. And so um, you'll hear from Shabika after my presentation and um, my apologies in advance. I'm going to have to run off to my nine o'clock class. I'll, I'll drop off shortly after my presentation here. Um, and we'll talk about some different types of maps that you can use in your, your broadband planning um, um, work um, there. As, you know, as Bill mentioned as well, we have um, our team at ISU is working on some maps. Um, I have we have some of these available for you now. Um, uh, some others will be available later um, on in your your workshop session in the the weeks to uh, to come. So we hope that these are things that you could use in your uh, in your planning um, efforts. Let me see. Should get the right slide here. There we go. Everybody see the slides okay on the screen now? Okay, excellent. Um, just want to acknowledge, oops, hold on, sorry about that. Get back here. Again. Okay, there we go. Um, a number of collaborators on the work that we've been been doing here that are listed on the the screen. So many to to mention. But I do want to mention that this is sort of a, a the product of a lot of brain trust of of coming together to some of the maps and the methods that we have uh, have developed here. Well, as you all uh, you know may be very well aware, maps can be very powerful for analysis and visualization to support your efforts for broadband advocacy and planning. You know everything from showing where you've got good coverage in your county and where you do not. Um, and a lot of other sorts of, of, of purposes. So do think about the value that you can bring to your efforts with maps. Maps are visuals, and a lot of people respond to, to visuals. They can kind of communicate in, in unique um, ways. And so our goal here is to develop some map products that can be useful for counties to um, in their efforts to expand rural broadband. And so we'll talk specifically about two different mapping tools. So we call mapping tool one and then mapping tool um, two. And they both have some different purposes. Mapping tool one, the idea is to estimate, use maps to estimate future agricultural potential of rural broadband expansion. So the idea here is how can we visualize what the added benefit of broadband would be to our county if it would essentially allow for more precision farming and increasing yields and essentially increasing um, the economic uh, benefits. So we'll look at that one. The second one, as Bill mentioned, is looking at sort of the, 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 the tactical sort side of things. 
how do we identify high points in your county? Maybe it's a grain bin, maybe it's a water tower and on maps and use those as potential uh, ways for planning um, in terms of expanding infrastructure, using those high points, tying them in to, um, to the, the broadband network to expand signal coverage throughout your, your county. So they both have kind of different purposes here. So let me talk a little bit about first about mapping tool one. Um, so again, the idea here is to forecast, to estimate added economic value of agricultural production if broadband were to be expanded in your county. So you can kind of think of these as maps that you can use to advocate for the uh, the value added for broadband. As we know, broadband, it's a big investment, but it also is an investment that is going to create additional yields and it's going to create additional economic uh, value for your county as well. And so that's what these maps are designed um, to do. Um, you know, the, the, the rationale is this. Uh, if we increase broadband in a rural county, that is going to allow farmers to engage more in precision agriculture. They're going to be able to use um, all of the benefits of precision ag that requires broadband essentially to run as you're doing uploads and downloads of big um, data sets. This has the potential to increase yields. So if you're growing corn or soybeans in your county and you're engaging in precision agriculture, you can potentially increase the yields in your county. That, of course, brings in additional dollars to the, the, the county's economy. So that's kind of the rationale that we use when we are, are developing these types of maps. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we visualize all of, of this? Um, now, just a little bit more about, you know, this precision agriculture, you know, you can think about um, the reduced costs that are involved with fertilizers and pesticides. So there have been a number of studies that have demonstrated that, you know, farmers with precision ag, they don't need to, to use as many fertilizers and pesticides. This can have some environmental benefits. This can have some cost savings benefits to the farmer as well. It can reduce labor costs also, and it can in increase yields as well. So we have all of these things that are sort of multipliers, if you will. We focus on the increased yield side of the equation here. There is a study um, by Lo Piccolo that was done by the FCC and the USDA a few years ago, and they basically quantified this. And the finding from the study was that uh, if you could substantially increase broadband in your in a rural county, you could expect up to a 3.6% gain in corn yield and a 3.8% gain in soybeans. And obviously that's very applicable to Illinois, given that we grow these row crops uh, uh, very frequently in many parts of the state. That 3.6 and 3.8% doesn't sound like a lot on the surface, but when you multiply that by thousands and thousands of acres in a county, it adds up very, very quickly. So that's what we use as the basis of our um, estimates. So let me just get quickly to the results here just to kind of show you um, what this looks like. So for every county, we have created one of these maps for your county. And let me just kind of walk through a little bit about what you're seeing here. So this is McLean County. This is where we're at here at ISU in, uh, in Bloomington Normal. What you're looking at on the map on the left is uh, unserved areas for the county. Um, so we don't have great internet broadband in these areas. The green is where we are growing soybeans and the yellow is where we are growing corn. And this was for the 2021 growing season. The map on the right is showing the underserved areas. So again, broadband isn't, um, the quality is not as good as what we would like. So again, yellow is where we are growing corn and then green is where we are growing soybeans. On the bottom is a table, and this table basically estimates the agricultural uh, potential. So, for example, if you look down here, you'll see the estimated number of acres uh, for unserved and underserved for both corn and soybeans. We estimate what the average bushels of production are currently, and then we estimate the added. So this is where that 3.6 and 3.8% gain comes. So this is the additional gain. And then if you multiply that out, take the market value, the price per bushel for corn and soybeans, this is what we can expect the added gain in production for that particular year. Now, just to cut to the, the end of the story here, um, if you look, for example, for McLean County, we're a big county, but it's over $12 million is what we estimate for a given growing season. If you were to ex fully expand broadband and if farmers were to utilize that um, it for precision agriculture.
Um, I'll just talk very briefly. I think it's you know important to know a little bit about how we come up with these numbers, and so I'll just give you a little bit of a, a a quick tour of of you know where these numbers come from and sort of how we do this in the GIS. Well, we start with looking at where broadband access is. So we've you know we rely on the maps provided by the broadband uh, lab, Shavika and um, her team um, there. Then what we do is we use, this is the U.S. Department of Agriculture has something called a cropland data layer. It's a really neat GIS map layer because it shows every year, every growing season, where we are growing different types of crops. So we obviously need to have that as well. So this is corn and soybeans in Illinois uh, here. So we utilize that. What we do is we take a county like McLean County. We, um, in this example, we'll just look at the underserved areas. So here's underserved areas in McLean County for that 2021 growing season. Then what we do is we get the cropland uh, layer. So again, you just see you know, yellow for corn, uh, green for, for soybeans. We essentially overlay those together and find the intersection. Where are the areas where we're growing corn and soybeans and also in the underserved areas? And so that's what you're seeing right here. Then what we can do is we can do some calculations. We can estimate uh, quantify the number of acres. We can calculate the number of acres here. Then we can assume these are the sort of the county averages. So 205 bushels per acre uh, and 66 bushels per acre for, for soybeans. And we can estimate the current production that we are getting in these underserved areas currently. Then what we can do is we can do our multiplier. We can take it times the 3.6, the 3.8. This is what we would expect to get the added gain in production if we were to be fully served by broadband. And so we can get those numbers. And then again, just multiply it out by the, the, the price um, bushels per acre. So corn, $5.40, uh, soybeans at $10.69 at the time of these um, calculations. So that's how we come up with, with the numbers there. That's how we estimate the, the projected gains. Um, as I mentioned, what we've got then is, is these maps. And then we've got these tables down here as, as well that can be used to sort of help us visualize um, just in this one small area. And keep in mind, there, as you all know, there are many benefits of broadband. This is We're just looking at one particular part of the economy that could benefit um, from broadband. Um, when you're interpreting these results, a couple of things just to keep in mind. Uh, you know, there are some assumptions and there's some limitations, of course, with this approach. We assume that farmers would adopt precision agriculture. So that's sort of an assumption that we're making here. Um, we are not calculating additional economic gains. So, for example, the reduced costs in fertilizers and pesticides, the reduced cost in labor, that's not being factored in here. That would be interesting to expand this model to do that, but it's not being. Essentially, we are just looking at corn and soybean production only. Um, some of your counties, you may be involved in other types of, of agriculture, maybe some dairying, maybe some other types of crops. We are simply looking at corn and soybeans here just because those are the pro predominant crops in Illinois. And these are also for one growing season. So, um, you know, this is one particular growing season. You could obviously multiply that out over a five-year span, a 10-year span, and so forth. Um, we have not validated these results with actual yields in, in areas. So that, that's kind of an interesting um, thing we'd like to do at some point is to sort of see, you know, a county down the road when they do improve their broadband, what do we see in terms of the actual yield gains and things like that? We are simply estimating things for now. We, Our best guess is we think these are conservative estimates. Um, and there's a number of factors for that, partly because when you look at broadband coverage maps, they generally tend to underestimate, uh, or I'm sorry, they tend to overestimate the coverage. In other words, there tends to be more of a trend saying that an area is served when it actually might be underserved or it might be unserved. And so if you take that assumption, um, you know, we, we expect that we're probably underestimating the gains, if, if anything. Okay, so that's a little bit about the first uh, mapping tool. Let me share the this, this second one. Here, what we are trying to do is to make maps showing vertical assets in your county. So we, we define a vertical asset basically as any type of a high point, any type of a structure that potentially could be used as a tower to expand uh, sort of the broadband infrastructure to tie it into the backbone. So sort of the, the middle mile approach for those of you who are familiar uh, with this to expand fixed wireless coverage in an area. The, the idea is this, 
if we can use these existing high points, we don't have to construct new towers. And so that can save time, that can save uh, money. Um, and so that's kind of the, what, what we're doing uh, here. So the idea here is to uh, figure out a, a middle mile solution using existing high points like a grain silo um, that could tie in to the internet backbone and essentially connect the farm to the, the, the last mile, if you will. Um, and so to do this, we have to be able to identify where these existing vertical assets are in a county. So, you know, where are the big grain bins, the water towers, those types of, of things. For many counties, there aren't maps that show these. And so that's what we've tried to develop. Um, here's McLean County. I just wanted to kind of point out here. So um, all of these red dots, these are different types of vertical assets that we have identified when we make the vertical asset map. Um, the FAA does have maps of vertical assets, obviously for air navigation, that's important. Um, there's a limitation though. They tend to be just the very, very high assets. So assets, things that are essentially 200 feet tall or above. So your huge you know, cell phone towers or things like, like that. Um, so that's, we kind of add to what they are already doing. Now, just a little bit again, just, uh, kind of under the under the hood, if you will, of how we, we do this, um, we use LIDAR, uh, which is light detection and ranging. And basically what LIDAR does is it, it's a way of mapping uh, to get a 3D surface. And so what we do is we, we, we have this type of data available for Illinois. And so we use, we rely on that to identify where these, these high points um, are. The end result is something like this. We have some, some grain elevators here. We have a couple of dots. And we can tell, we know how high, very precisely, how tall those assets um, are. So that's essentially what we're doing. We're extracting those high points. Um, here's an example. So again, we've got these grain bins. This on an aerial image, this is what these grain bins look like from above. And so what we do is we use the, the LIDAR. This is what's called a digital surface model. And essentially what this does is the white are the higher areas and the black are the lower areas. So this is showing us essentially the height of, of objects. And we can essentially subtract that from the bare earth. So if you imagine this is the just the elevation itself without the, the features that are on the surface, we can essentially then subtract those two and come up with a, a map that looks like this. So this is telling us the height. So these grain bins are over 80 feet tall. We can get them down to within a, a foot or two of the actual height. And then what we do is we simply just convert those to points. We just say, okay, here's a point, here's a point, here's a point. And we have those. And now we have a map showing vertical assets in our, our county. Uh, the biggest challenge in doing this is trees. Um, we don't consider trees to be vertical assets. We don't think those obviously would be their tall things, but they don't, they, they wouldn't be useful. Um, so that's kind of the biggest challenge is how do we remove trees from all of this? And so we do do that as best we can. Um, we have ways of, of using satellite imagery to identify where trees, the forested areas are, and essentially ex uh, you know, remove those from the vertical assets. Well, what does this look like? Um, for each county, we will provide you with your own interactive map that shows vertical assets. Um, and you can then use this to kind of, you know, explore and see um, vertical assets in your own um, um, community. So as Bill mentioned, we're working on these. There's a little bit of data processing that takes, um, I estimate, probably within the next three or four weeks or so. Um, I'll be back in touch with your own vertical asset uh, map. Um, I'll show you just an example of what one of these looks like. So this is Hancock County. Um, and essentially you've got all these red dots. These are the vertical assets. It's, you know, an interactive map. You can um, change things around here and, you know, put on, you know, satellite imagery. You can zoom in and zoom out and, you know, things um, like, like that. Um, what you can also do in here is we have a filter that you can use also. And essentially what the filter is designed to do is to help you know, limit the assets that you're seeing. So for example, you may just want to find assets that are, you know, 50 feet or taller, let's just say. So what I could do here is I can go into the map and I can basically then say, um, you know, I want uh, vertical assets that are greater than 50 feet. And then essentially what it will do is this, it will limit those. So if you want to find the really high assets, you can, can do that. So that's what this map is designed to do that as well. Um, we also have a, a little catalog here 
And so this is kind of just to give you an idea of, you know, what are some different types of assets in my county? So different types of grain bins and structures. And we have height thresholds here too that can help, you know, you as you're, if you're looking for a specific type of a silo or something um, like, uh, like that. So that's the vertical assets um, maps there. Um, we hope these are useful in your planning. We had uh, one of the cohorts of the counties last time, um, you know, work this into the survey. Uh, once the assets were identified, there might be a, a particular part of the county where, hey, this, you know, let's talk to the landowner if they would be willing to host um, uh, some infrastructure using their vertical assets. So you could work that into your survey and and kind of, you know, help that in, in, in your planning um, if you want to go this middle mile route to expand fixed wireless in the uh, in the county. So that's what we've got. Um, let me just conclude here with just you know some resources for um, for your county here. Um, one we have a I'm going to put this link in the chat here. Um, what we've got is a a link for you that has um, essentially these these resources. And so I'll just drop this in the chat. You'll see it on the screen there as well. And I'll have Nancy um, put this in the the weekly email. Also, let me find the chat. There it is. Okay, here it is. It's basically just a Google Drive link, and there's some things in here. So um, the first thing I want to show you is if you go into this, you'll see the corn, soybean, broadband estimate maps. So you will find a folder with your county in here, and we've got all those maps are ready to go. So you've got a county, um, and we did these. These are estimates for the 2022 growing season. So you can go in, find your county there, and you've got a map that you can then uh, use. So these are all done and they are ready to go um, for you. You'll see other counties in here as, as well. So that's one resource that is there and is, is ready for you to go. Um, I'll just kind of briefly put them up on the screen. This is an interesting cohort because the, the corn and soybean production varies quite a bit. We are going way north to way south in the, in the, the county or in the, in the state here, but just to give you a quick preview. So there's Boone County. Here's Johnson, not as much, you know, corn and soybean production. Uh, here's Lawrence County, uh, Lee County, Massac County, and then there's Vermilion County um, there. But those are all there. Um, your vertical assets maps, as I mentioned, are coming soon. Stay tuned. We'll have them for you within the next month or so, and I'll, I'll be in touch once those are, are ready. Um, We'll have a little tip sheet as well for you for how to use the vertical assets. You know, how do you do the filter, you know, that type of thing. So we'll have a little sheet for you that you can use along with the links for your county maps. Um, I do just want to quickly point out as well, um, some of the other, you know, re, uh, you know, if you're interested more in learning about how we do this, or if somebody has questions about, you know, how did they develop these maps, there are a lot of resources there as well. Um, some of you are familiar with the, the, the Benton report that came out a couple of months ago. Um, and this report, I have that in the, in the folder as well. There's a reports folder um, that talks a little bit about how we do this work, but also maybe more importantly, how the counties that participated in the first broadband breakthrough cohort last spring, how they use these in their own county planning. So that perhaps might be of interest to, to, um, to you as you're trying to you know, think through how you might actually use these maps in your planning. Um, sometimes people are, they want to dig in more about how we did this. Sometimes some county planning teams sometimes have GIS folks involved and want to, you know, learn a little bit more. We've got some reports. These are our reports for the grants that we did to develop these methods. So again, if you want to, you know, if you want even more details on how we've done this, um, those are available as, uh, as well, along with step-by-step -step instructions. If you want to do some of this on your own, or if you have, you know, partners in another county that want to try this on their own, you know, we've, we're, we're, we've been very uh, wanting to share the, how we do this in the GIS um, also. Um, so here's just an example. You know, we've got the project reports and, you know, how we do this and, and all of that. Um, I'm obviously a resource as well. I'm glad to, you know, please reach out. There's my email there. Any questions that you have about the maps or anything uh, along those lines, you know, please feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm very glad um, to do that as, as well. So let me just, I'll just go back here just in finality here. Um, if you would like my copy of my slides, those are in here as well. Um, and then here's the reports folder. You can kind of see some of those reports that I mentioned that are, are available also 
um, for you. So with that, um, <clears throat> I will uh, wrap up. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Otherwise, we'll turn it over to, uh, to Shabika for more mapping. Uh, thank you so much, John. That's I, I think that's really an amazing uh, activity just to begin to think about the benefits of broadband and how those can be documented and probably in many different ways. And mm -hmm. we've been working mm -hmm. a little bit with Missouri and they've got quite a impact analysis process, very extensive, but I think yours is a, uh, in many of our counties so important to see what those benefits are. Uh, in specific locations, I think is is great. So any questions for John? And as I said, take a look at the information, share that with your ag community. This is really a part of your messaging out to the community about how important broadband mm -hmm. is when you can see all this additional revenue that would flow through your county uh, with the investment of broadband in the rural places. So it can be a great part of the, you know, map one is really all about that messaging. Map two is about how do we implement uh, broadband networks. So uh, both front end and uh, back end value here. So, uh, and then the question, when will the vertical assets, uh, I thought you said about a month or five weeks? Yeah, yeah, let's plan on that. I've got students that are working on this as we speak. So um, that we've. I think we we're getting this, we're cranking out counties and we're, we're getting in a roll on this. So yeah, expect, let me just say, let's just say mid-April, um, maybe sooner, but let's just go with mid-April for now. And, and I'll let you know as soon as we got them ready. Good, good. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome, Shabika. I already talked to them. Um, uh, Shabika Agarwal is with the Illinois Broadband Lab in the Office of Broadband, and uh, I never know who she's working for at any given moment, but uh, 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 has been with us now for several years working on uh, helping communities with surveys and maps, and has become more and more proficient and uh, provides uh, more and more valuable information to the communities every time we go through one of these sessions. So. Uh, Shabika, welcome, and uh, thank you for your work. Hi, Bill. Hi, all. Thank you so, so much. So we're going to talk more mapping today, and I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to get started. We have quite a lot of information like we usually do in these presentations, but we'll try to make the most sense of it and keep it easy. So broadband mapping and data. Um, so in Today's presentation will be talking about the Illinois Broadband Map and the FCC National Broadband Map. Both of these resources really helpful. The Illinois Broadband Map, more specifically for uh, the state grant program. And then we have the FCC map, which is more dedicated to the BEAD funding that's coming in uh, from the IIGA Act. We'll look at the Illinois Broadband Map, a quick demo. Um, a lot of you might have participated in the bead challenge process. If you want to put that in the chat, it'll be good to know um, if your counties were able to organize and put in some challenges there. Um, if not, we certainly understand that, you know, it could have been a challenging timeline, uh, but we'll still share a few resources because there's going to be opportunity for comments uh, moving forward in April. Um, then we have Kwong for our, from our team who's going to be sharing the mapping packets created for each of the counties and we'll have some time for question and answers towards the end. So starting off with the Illinois broadband map and the FCC national broadband map. Um, the Illinois broadband map, if you've been following broadband and just like, you know, the Illinois Office of Broadband webinars, you've probably seen how the map has changed um, since it first went live in June 2021. So that is when it had polygons to represent service areas. Um, and at that point in time, it was much more granular than the FCC data, which was at the census block level. Um, so we had much more recent data, more granular, and we used to have a, an update every six months. Um, so since then, uh, we've had the FCC fabric come out in late 2022. Uh, and that's gotten to the location level, the address level, and referred to as the location IDs for each of those associated addresses on the map. 
So that is when we also switch to that because that is going to be the primary sort of resource and identification for locations for the BEAT funding. Um, and then just to make it easier for folks to like understand and make sense of all of that point data for their counties and larger regions, um, since June 2023, we have that location data plus all of that aggregated into hex bins so that it's easier to make sense if these are the areas where there's access and this is where it's not. Uh, we have links to both of the maps here. We'll be sharing these presentations and um, yeah, there's going to be more on this. So before we dive into this, uh, just want to mention also the difference between the two grant programs and how you know these resources, these mapping resources can be helpful as you try um, for different funding opportunities for your counties. So the eligibility firstly for the two programs is slightly different in terms of the technology types. So with Connect Illinois, any location that does not currently have access to wireline technology is eligible for funding. And for BEAD, they actually also consider licensed fixed wireless and licensed by rule fixed wireless. Um, if you've been following BEAD, you probably know what these different ones mean. Um, there's also a link here to the FCC definitions for each of these technologies, uh, but just meaning that um, they also consider some of the fixed wireless technologies um, non-eligible for BEAD. And as I've mentioned earlier, we have the Connect Illinois eligibility on the Illinois broadband map. And then we have the bead challenge. And yeah, this is already live. So we're going to be taking a look at that later today. Uh, so the bead challenge map, and some of you might have already looked at it because we've had these month weekly webinars every Wednesday to share a little more about the process. So the speed thresholds um, are for both the programs are the same. Any location that does not have access to 25 by three megabits per second uh, speeds, that would be considered unserved. Any location that does not have, uh, that has speeds between 25 by three and 100 by 20, uh, that would be considered underserved. So that's some basic difference between um, the two grant programs, the state and the federal funding program for broadband infrastructure. So now uh, we'll get into the Illinois broadband map demo. In the slides here, uh, I've also highlighted some of the different layers that we're going to look at. There's definitely a lot of information um, on the map. So like just trying to condense it and point you to the most um, helpful layers on the map. So uh, switching screens here, it's going to be this. We want to make sure we're seeing the map at this point, maybe not. I'll stop sharing and share again. Okay, so this is the Illinois broadband map, quite a few tabs happening here. So we'll firstly start with the access tab and the general tab here. So the general one being really helpful, it has a bunch of boundary layers, depending on what you're interested in. You can select county boundaries, um, the state house districts, um, Senate districts, townships, cities, and all of that. For this presentation, let's just go with county boundaries, just so that it's easier for us to make sense of what's happening. Uh, we can also look at statistics for every county. There's some query tools that we have right here um, on the right side. Um, so if you were to look at the school districts on your, um, as well, if, you know, you have school districts engaged and part of your team, um, that might be a good statistic that we want to look at. So I am randomly going to select one of these school districts, um, and I will see, zooms into that particular district and gives us a statistic of how many locations have access two broadband based on different speeds. So 25 by three, um, almost all locations in the district have access to that. If you're looking at only 25 by three wireline, that's 98.09. .09. And similarly, we have that statistic for the other speeds. As we go to higher, uh, 100 megabits per second symmetrical speeds, we'll see that number has significantly decreased. Um, so this could be helpful There's also by county that you might be interested in. So certainly, you know, look at some of that. When we zoom in, there's also this broadband serviceable locations data that, you know, gets 
um, activated. And this is essentially based on the FCC maps, just so that you have a sense of like, you know, locations and how they're categorized. So going back to the legend, what do these different colors mean? The greens are were based on data reported to the FCC by providers. There's at least 100 by 20, so they're considered served. Uh, and then there's the yellow, which are the underserved, and then there's the red, uh, which are unserved. And for bead funding, it's essentially the yellow and the red that is um, eligible. But then there are a few other factors that define eligibility, like um, you know any other state or federal grant programs um, that you know an area might have received, so they would be ineligible. So I would just recommend folks to like use this to get a sense of how a location is categorized based on the service that's reported. Uh, but if you want to specifically look at eligibility for BEAD, we'll look at the BEAD challenge map in some time and that will be the best resource. So now for this presentation, let's basically look at one of the counties we have. Let's do the SAC County. Um, and again, the map zooms into that particular county. We can zoom out so that I see the entire county. We look at the few, um, you know, we have access layers by different speeds and technology. So just because uh, with bead, there's this distinction between licensed, fixed wireless, and unlicensed, we can see some of those uh, layers separately here. For this demonstration, let's look at everything that's 100 by 20. So as I mentioned, we have aggregated data into hex pins. So all of this, now when I click on a hex pin, I get to see how many locations within that hexagon are actually served by the speed tier and technology that I have selected. So in this case, 100% uh, of the locations in this particular hexagon are served by 100 by 20 wireline. And um, yeah, if it's a different number, when you click on it, it's, yeah, so this has like 90%. And you can try to reconcile some of that with um, the location data itself, where we see not you know there are a few unserved locations um, in this hexagon as well. So that's why it's you know at that ninety percent. So zooming out again, um, let's look at some of the other layers. So looking at hundred by twenty, let's look at the licensed fixed wireless. Uh, so we see some of these areas here. So it seems like uh, MISAC does not really have a lot of that license fixed wireless. But then we have some in Pulaski that's showing up here in blue. Again, one recommendation is you're you know turning on different layers because there is a value attributed to each of these hexagons. It'll be helpful if you turn this off. Um, the previous one, if you only want to look at license fixed wireless so this way when I'm clicking on a particular hexagon I know the statistic is um, for license fixed wireless uh, but if there's like an overlap when I had turned down the other one I could just be getting um, different pieces of information so that might be a little confusing so that's that's one tip just make sure as you're looking at some of these hexagon layers uh, you have just one turned on so that it's easier to make sense of the data. Um, and then there's also the 100 by 20 unlicensed fixed wireless. Again, if this is the only technology that's available, uh, these locations would be eligible for bead funding and a similar functionality with how many of those locations in that hexagon are served um, by that particular speed and technology. So we also have included this in the mapping packets and Kwong's gonna be sharing a little more about that towards the end of the presentation. Um, in this tab, a few other things I'd like to, uh, to bring your attention to are the maximum. Let's actually do the technology. So I'm again going to go turn off this so that it makes more sense. Home extent takes me back to the state. Uh, looking at cable broadband. So again, this is on the hexagon level as we zoom in. Um, it gets a little more granular and will have a similar functionality of how much of that um, hexagon is served by cable technology in this case. So we have DSL, we have, let's take a look at fiber for this one and let's look at maybe another county. Let's look at Lee for this example. Again, zooming out to see the entire county. And we see there's 
very sparse uh, fiber access in the county, a little bit towards the northern portions and a little bit here. So yeah, definitely not a lot of fiber in Lee County for the maps. Um, we also have density of providers. That's something that constantly comes up in terms of competition um, and you know affects affordability and things like that. So if you want to look at how many, the lighter the yellow, it's fewer providers. So a lot of the areas in Lee County only have one provider um, that's available. Um, and then you'll probably definitely have darker shades of blue in areas that have um, more options um, of providers. So these are some of the important layers here. We've been talking about Connect Illinois. Um, so we have our next application deadline on 1st of April, but then it's still going to be open and we'll be accepting applications until July 1. So if, you know, as you progress through the program, if there are... Um, if this is a grant program you're interested in and would like to pursue, we have the Connect Illinois grant eligibility layer. Again, it seems like the entire state is kind of eligible, but when you click on a certain um, hexagon, you'll again get a sense of how many locations in there are eligible. And when you zoom in a little more, it gets more granular in terms of where exactly those um, non wireline locations are that would be eligible for the program. So... Looking in Prune County for this example, it's in there. Zooming out so I can see the entire county. And yeah, so it's this again, when you click on a county, you can also see the statistics for that county by different speeds and technologies. So that might also be a good starting point to get a sense of uh, what access looks like. Um, and a lot of areas here would be eligible for funding. Uh, the round three grant program has been open for a while. We've been accepting applications. So there's a bunch of different layers here um, for all the applications that we have received um, in different phases. So if we go on to the home extent again um, and turn off eligibility for a bit. So all of these green areas are where we have received applications for. Uh, we're going to be making a word announcement soon. That is when we'll have a better sense if this is what got awarded and then um, the remaining would then be eligible. Some of the other layers that define eligibility here is any area that has received um, you know, prior Connect Illinois funding would be ineligible. So we have some of that information. If you click on the project, you'll get more details. And that was also the case for any of the applications that we've received. There's gonna be more on the funding requested, the areas and the households they plan to cover. Similarly with round one, uh, we also have RDOF uh, winners here. So all of the green um, are the authorized areas. That might be something you wanna look at as you're defining um, your project area for a Connect Illinois application. And then there's also the USDA grants um, that have been received uh, in the state. And uh, again, clicking on it, a lot of these layers gives you more information. So whenever you look at something, it's a good idea to just see if there's a pop-up that shows up uh, that gives you more information there. Um, so I think these are the most, like the more important programs that you'd want to look at. There's also the federal funding tab down here, which has information on all of these other programs as well. If you're interested to know whether there's ACAM or CAF2, funding. And again, there's RDOF here as well. So you can explore um, some of these layers down here. But I think the most important ones are covered in grant eligibility. Um, anyways, so again, going back to a county, I think um, one of the good features here is also you can look up a provider um, who's serving a certain location. So I'm going to turn on the broadband serviceable location as well. So I know where exactly locations are. Um, and I can either type in an address or just use this pin tool here and click on a location to know uh, who are the different providers um, who have reported access at that location. So that's Frontier, Rise, we have the technology that they've reported and also the speeds. So quite a few different providers reporting access at this um, location. 
So yeah, this feature available on the Illinois broadband map, but then you can also look at the FCC national broadband map, which also has this address level information for all of the locations. Uh, now, very quickly looking at some of the statistics layers. So if you're interested to kind of see the intersectionality between some of the socioeconomic characteristics and access. So just quickly for an example, looking at income, um, the darker, the green, um, lower median household income. And if it's, sorry, it's higher uh, um, median household income. And if it's a shade of blue, that's lower. Again, if you click on a census tract, um, there's more information on what exactly that income looks like. You might want to overlay it with um, access to say 100 by 20 because that um, you know defines eligibility in most cases. So you know, yeah, it's, it's just looking at some of these intersectionalities. And if you're like, this is a low income area, but then it has a lot of license fixed wireless. Let's see. If there's Y line here as well, okay. So then there's probably things to do with um density that kind of help that decision making. Um, you can also look at some of the broadband adoption statistics here. So percentage of households with an internet subscription. Again, looking at the legend, um, the greater so say the darker the green the greater the uh, percentage of households with an internet subscription. So on here, it seems like the central part of the county is pretty dark green, greater than 85% subscription. Um, so yeah, there's, there's different things you can look at in the statistics tab, percent of households without, uh, with no internet uh, subscription or access. So again, there's some different colors happening here. The lighter, the green, that's a lower portion the lighter the orange, um, that's a lower percentage of households with no internet subscription. Um, and then the darker the orange, there's more of those households. Again, seems like um, the southeast and the northern portions of some of those um, higher. And again, as I mentioned, because we have these hexagon layers turned on, so even if there is no hexagon um, that's colored, so that's why the 0%. So turning on hexagon layers, um, yeah, can be a little tricky to just be careful and make sure what's turned on, what's turned off. Um, yeah, and then there's one other feature if you have your GIS teams, if you have your own data set um, that, you know, for locations that you might be interested in, or even as you get maybe the vertical assets map, if you want to bring it to this map and compare it to some of the other layers, uh, you can bring in a shapefile or a KML or CSV, and that just shows up on the maps, it might be helpful as you want to look at different data sets altogether. So just a lot of features here, um, and hopefully it's helpful. If, if there's any time questions on how do we make use of some of the data on here, um, definitely feel free to reach out. Uh, we do have some of these layers here for download. So the grant eligibility file, um, the hexagon layer that we had seen um, right here, that is available for download. Um, and then all of the applications that we received um, are also available for download as a shapefile or KMZ. So that's a quick Illinois broadband map demo. Um, now moving on to some of the other um, resources. So we have the bead challenge map, and I'm gonna quickly open that and share screen again. Yeah, so again, let me look at the chat. Do we have somebody who has participated in the bead challenge process? If you want to have a quick show of hands or maybe a text in the chat, that'll be helpful for me to get a sense of who's really looked at some of these resources previously. Okay, so not hearing anything. Uh, just seems like we'll just do a really quick um, demo of what's really happening and what's the information that is shared on the the challenge map. So this is the one that basically we had the challenge phase open until yesterday. 
day before yesterday. So Monday was the last day, March 18th. That is when we were accepting challenges. Um, the objective is to define all the unserved and underserved locations in the state that would be eligible for BEAT funding. We already have some of that information based on the data reported by ISPs. And then, as I've mentioned, there's also enforceable commitments, which is any previous state or federal funding that a location might have received. So we don't want to be duplicating efforts. And so that will be marked as ineligible for BEAT funding. Um, again, you can type in addresses here and let's just take an example of one of the locations. Anything that's in red is considered served either because if the service reported at that location or um, if it has a previous um, state or federal funding program. So you look at the address, the location ID associated. This is served based on the providers, uh, Xfinity cable service, um, 1200 by 35, so making it served, it is not part of any kind of enforceable commitment. Um, and then we have a few greens here as well. So those would be unserved locations eligible for funding. Again, no prior enforceable commitment and also doesn't have um, any of the eligible technologies here. So that's what makes it eligible for funding. So a lot to explore here on this map. You can also just look at locations that have some kind of enforceable commitment. If you turn on this filter uh, and then you click on it, you'll see the program that it is currently funded. Um, it's part of. So there's that information. Again, providers, when you click on it, um, there's information on who's reported service at those locations. Um, there, as I mentioned, there's going to be an opportunity to actually um, participate in some of the rebuttal fees. That's going to happen starting April 16th. Um, we have a dashboard just if you want to like follow along and see what really happened, who submitted challenges for your specific county. We have like a live dashboard. It's called the B Challenge Dashboard. We'll be sharing links to all of this in the presentation. So just looking at the overview, these are all the locations that have received some kind of challenge. And when you zoom in, to a particular, maybe, you know, your specific county, um, click for details, you get a location ID, and you can see all the challenges received for that specific location. So our team is now in the next month going to look at all of these submissions, just make sure it's the right kind of information and pass that along for the next phase, which is the rebuttal phase. So we'll definitely keep all of you counties posted on how you can participate in some of that, uh, but that's not happening until April 16th. So definitely a lot of time for you to catch up and get a sense of what was submitted and how well you can, you know, just, just participate in the rebuttal phase um, of this process. Um, there's also the CAI challenges. So whether or not um, some of the locations are CAIs or not, that's shown here. And then mm -hmm. we have area challenges as well. So yeah, a lot of learning here. Shabika? Yes. Uh, could you go back to that map that had the circles on it that looked like a fixed wireless kind of challenge? Can you yeah. yes. say a little bit more about what's going on in this map? I think it's important. Sure, exactly. Um, um, so we have, and I'm not sure where exactly I zoomed in, but as Bill mentioned, there's a bunch of these circular, um, you know, location sets here. So let me actually now click in one of these here. Um, so this is a planned or existing service submitted by Watch Communications for, um, you know, area where they are planning some kind of service. So again, um, if you might be aware, Watch Communications is a licensed fixed wireless technology also mentioned here. So a lot of the challenges we received for plan and existing service during the B challenge phase are from licensed fixed wireless providers. And they have like these propagation models which tell you how far from their tower they can actually serve people. So that is the reason why a lot of those planned or existing service challenges from fixed wireless providers would look like circles because that's how the technology kind of works. And as John had mentioned earlier, there might be like, you know, the signal strengths might vary just because of tree cover and, you know, differences in line of sight and things. But it's usually some of these circular models, as you might see, some of these here might be obstructed. Um, 
from tree cover or they might already be reported uh, could be one of the two scenarios but then it's mostly going to be some sort of a circular formation with a lot of these planned or existing challenges coming from fixed wireless providers so definitely a lot of those and then we had a bunch of different challenge types around availability if consumers weren't receiving the speeds that they had subscribed to or if there was high latency um, or if there was business service only so a lot of those different challenges here um we just did not were there like... many challenges excuse me were there many challenges from uh providers saying that uh their competitors were over promising or was it mostly um, fixed wireless companies saying we have more service than we're credited for i think definitely both of them uh one of the cases that i'm kind of aware of is um in jackson county there was a lot of momentum and partnership with existing providers uh and they had some suspicions about um the service reported by fixed wireless providers. So we had uh, one of the cable companies actually partner with the county to submit a challenge that we think that there's an overstatement in what one of the wireless providers has reported in the county. So we did definitely see some of that. And I think that, again, Jackson County was also part of the Accelerate program. So they kind of had built those successful partnerships with providers in their county. And so it was really helpful for them to like, you know, have a more technical sort of backing to be able to put in a challenge like that. So, yeah, we'll have more okay. statistics on the different challenge types and um, how the challenge phase really turned out. But I think, yeah, at this point, there's a lot of challenges we received, a total of 236, almost 237,000 from 132 registrants in the state, a really good mix of local governments, nonprofits, and ISPs. So it was really good to see some of our counties that engaged with us in the past to actively participate in this process. And then we, all of these challenges um, include 160,000 unique locations and CAIs. So definitely a really good effort by the entire um, state, really, and all of our um local governments and nonprofits as well. Thank you. Yeah. So if there's like more questions on this, if you haven't been able to like follow this process previously, definitely feel free to reach out to us. We'll put an email address in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, there is a lot here and we're happy to help you in any way you'd like to participate in the process. So we're almost to the end of our presentation here. I'm going to share the presentation again real quick. So we looked at the B challenge map. Um, and then here's the screenshot, the B challenge dashboard, the rebuttal phase starting April 16th. Um, here's a quick timeline. As I'd mentioned, uh, we had the challenge phase that wrapped up March 18th. We'll have the challenge validation in the next month until April 15th. This is where the office is doing all the work, so we do not require any participation at this point in time, but there's going to be more ways to engage um, during the rebuttal phase, which is going to be happening April 16 to May 6. And then again, the state's going to be working on the adjudication of things and making those final determinations and have the final list of unserved and unserved locations in the state. Um, there is the B challenge landing page dceo.illinois.gov slash challenge. all the resources that we've had the different webinars it's all on there so if you want to familiarize yourself with the process i think this would be one page to look at it has a bunch of different resources that can help you make more sense of the process and what we've done so far uh now the ma mapping packets i'm going to share uh pass over the mic to kong and he's going to share um, about the packets that we've created for all on the slide here, just so that you have a sense of what's shared. We have some of the important links, and then we have the different maps that we have created. So over to you, Kong. Thank you, Shabika. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so I'll quickly share my screen. Um, to the so uh, I'll also put the link to this box folder in the chat. Um, so we have prepared um, a list of resources, maps, and you know um, data 
for all the six counties for this cohort. So this is one of the examples. Uh, I, I selected Johnson County. So uh, I'm just going to go through the um, PowerPoint that we prepare. Uh, so the first kind of map that we have is the 25 by 3 megabyte speed uh, map, uh, which shows the areas in the in each county that has you know the speed uh, in the hexagon. Um, there's a legend at the bottom as well. Um, the 100 by 20 megabyte as well. Um, again, uh, showing the, the the locations with the uh, the hexagons and one by uh, one gigabit um, access uh, fixed broadband, and as well as the end serve and end serve areas based on the state um, broadband maps data. The data is the last updated in January, so this is the latest um, using our latest fabric that we have. Um, similarly, we have this um, serve and serve and serve. It's pretty much the same data, but here we included the serve, which is in green, as Shabika was running through earlier in the Illinois broadband map. Uh, we also included the single provider locations that show up uh, as a serve on the FCC map, which will be helpful to look for locations for potential speed test outreach. Um, and here's the legend. This is based on the technology such as DSO cable and fixed wireless locations in each county. And we also have this uh, map for the access by technology showing again the DSL service um, in purple um, and cable service in red and the 100 by 20 megabyte uh, service in uh, the light blue area and um, in each county. And also another um, access by technology is the gigabit speed, um, which is represented here in brown or golden ish color. And this is also the access by technology, which is the mobile data, the 5G and LTE um, represented in each county, the coverage map for, 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 the, for the area. So we also prepared the, another map, which, is, which comes directly from the Census Bureau website, uh, the percent of household without internet subscription by census tract. Um, this is the total population in household um, with no computer in, in, in the household in percentage. Uh, we also have, a, so, some of the counties also have this map, which is the federal funding programs that meet the BEAT requirements. Some counties might not have this map because there's no um, coverage for this, uh, there's no data for this, uh, for this uh, program. And we also included the federal funding and um, the FCC register estimate structures, uh, which shows how many antennas are, uh, antennas exist in each county. And we also provided some, a list of um, resources such as the link to the Illinois Broadband Map and the Census Bureau data that we use in the in the PowerPoint and the resources, and in the in the box box folder, all the list of the resources that we have and that we provided are all included in there. We also included the list of um uh, ISPs as well as the project names, which are the federal funding needs uh federal funding that meet the beat requirements. So it's in the Excel sheet file. Back to you, should be good. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Kong. And I think just one other resource on there. So this is not in the county folders, um, but on the in the folder itself, when you go on there, there's uh, a presentation on the USDA reconnect eligibility. Um, so this basically there's a bunch of different layers on your the application starts March twenty second and ends uh, May twenty one again. Uh, pretty close, starting pretty soon, but you have time until May 21. If this is something that you're interested in, we have links to like, you know, the map that's going to be most um, updated. So definitely look at that link, but there's a lot of different layers on there. So I think based on the existing data that we have, we have tried to explain some of, you know, what those different layers mean. Um, and there are also some evaluation criteria that basically... Um, affects the scoring of the application. So if some of these socially vulnerable areas and most unserved per square mile areas are included in the application, that's going to mean more points. Um, so we have some of that information for each of the counties and we've overlaid that with um, the unserved and underserved. So you have a sense of eligibility and also the need at the same time. So we have all of this together, uh, just because there's quite a few slides on the overview of the program as well. So it's just the gray areas with no kind of shading that would be eligible. So in this case with Johnson, seems like um, a lot of those areas might not be eligible because they're covered through other 
um, state or federal programs. So we have that information for all of the counties. And again, um, the link to the eligibility map on here, this will have the latest data. So again, recommend using some of these links for the most current data sets. But um, yeah, so all of this available in the links that we've shared in the chat. So if you have any questions, happy to answer them now. Good, and that uh, reconnect as we learned last week is a very powerful, or well, sorry, I got my cohorts mixed up. We're a uh, 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 USDA Reconnect is a very uh, excellent grant program, and uh, some of your smaller uh, ISPs that are uh, traditional telephone cooperatives or privately held companies, they're the ones who are most likely to be able to apply for and receive those grants. So if you're talking uh, in your broadband interviews with the uh, providers um, that we'll be getting into here, uh, maybe you've already started those conversations. You know that's an excellent program to uh, indicate your interest and in, and see how you might uh, apply for funds if you see that you have eligible areas in your county. Uh, other questions for Shabika. Shabika, this is uh, Justin in Moon County. Um, not Justin. This is Justin. Um, <laughs> So are the um are these shape files and the raw data available um for like a GIS department to download uh or any of the raw data uh to uh, for the individual counties? Um so as I mentioned the grant eligibility for Connect Illinois round three that's available as a shape file on the map itself on the right side. There's a link to that. Um if you want to work with the location data, which is a lot of the FCC mapping. Um, again, we'll share links to this. If you don't already have access to the FCC fabric, which is all the locations or broadband serviceable locations in the state or in your county specifically, it just becomes a little difficult to join the two data sets and make sense of all of those location IDs that are included in that data. So I think the first step, if you want to work with the FCC data is to be able to get to access to that fabric, I would say, and that's pretty easy um, so we'll share links. It's just as easy as filling out a form. And because you're a county department working on this, you should be able to get that access fairly quickly. Um, and then there's a bunch of location data that you can actually bring into GIS and um, run your analysis on. Okay, Shabika's thank happy you. to help you do that as well. So yeah. just a quick email, she'll lead you through that process. I expect your GIS folks can navigate it without much uh, uh, assistance, but she's always there to help. Yep. Good question, thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? Good, well, if not, then uh, we're gonna, uh, we've got a worksheet that uh, Reed will put in the chat and uh, you can click on that. And just as you think about your map packets, and I'd encourage you to, uh, go and download that. And I, I had to reboot my computer, so I lost what was in the chat, but I think that we had the map packet addresses in the chat. And um, uh, you'd be able to take a look at your maps and uh, um, uh, just kind of begin to talk about them. How does that reflect the reality of what you experience every day in terms of eligibility? and um, uh, and uh, uh, go from there. And then you're free to work on your survey discussions. And, and uh, I know that at least one community is thinking, well, we needed some additional folks on our team. Maybe they can strategize a little bit about that. And, and I'm happy to join, uh, uh, I guess, uh, with that county to talk about that uh, even right today, uh, about how to get additional participation in your county. And that's really finding the right doorways into different parts of your community and convince them of that is, it can be a challenge. Other folks have those connections that makes it pretty easy, but we'll, uh, uh, we'll uh, I'll come around to those meetings as well. So you can see um, Shabika's email address, you can see the map packets, and you can see the uh, worksheet there in the chat. 
So Reed today is uh, responsible for running the uh, breakout room. So he's going to open those up now and uh, uh, just keep plugging away. And I, I expect that you're feeling a little overwhelmed with the, between the survey and the, the maps and so on right now. Uh, just know that it, uh, it, not everything has to be done in the next day. Uh, so just keep plugging away and, and you'll be surprised at how far you'll go in the next several weeks. So thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Good. Well, Reed, why don't you open up those rooms then? Yep, uh, they should be open. If anyone uh, is having issues, let me know. You'll have to give me some graces. I don't have, we don't have the master Nancy with us. Awesome. Thanks all. Um, I got a drop bill, but yeah, if folks have any questions, they can certainly reach out to me via email. Happy to help. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you be good. Thanks to Kong as well. Okay, gentlemen, I'm jumping into the leave room. Great. Sounds good. Quite a bit, like all up uh, Sammy, Logan, and Justin's, uh, you know, alley there. But, um, you know, as I said, I missed that kind of the first 40 minutes, honestly. So does anybody want to give me a, give me an idea of, of where things were at and, and, and what we're what we're looking at with this? with this session? Well, a 